Part One, Chapter Twelve A of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Seventeen ninety one to seventeen ninety two. Residence in Holland. I resumed my life at Paris at the Hotel de la Guerre. Nearly every morning I rode on horseback, accompanied by my cousin Dominique Sheldon. I often went to the theatre with young Madame de Noailles, whose mother, Madame Laborde, did not go out. Every day my father-in-law became more disgusted with the ministry. Nearly all the regiments of the army were in a state of revolt. The greater part of the officers, instead of opposing the efforts of the revolutionists with consistent firmness, sent in their resignations and left France. Emigration became a point of honour. The officers who remained with their regiments received letters from those who had emigrated reproaching them for cowardice and lack of attachment to the royal family. They endeavoured to make them see that it was their duty to abandon their sovereign. They promised them the intervention of enormous armies of foreigners. The king, whose feebleness was equal to his goodness, hesitated to arrest this torrent. It thus happened that every day saw the departure of some members of his party or even of his household. My father-in-law, who was powerless against the intrigues of the assembly, and who did not find in the king the firmness which he had a right to expect, resolved to leave the ministry. This he did on the 15th of November, 1790. It was proposed that my husband should succeed him. He had just finished a plan for the reorganization of the army, which was entirely his own work. The king himself felt that the author of this plan was capable of putting it into operation. My husband refused. He did not wish to succeed his father, for fear that the matter would be misinterpreted. It was at this time, in the last days of December 1790, that he was given the place of Minister Plenipotentiary to Holland. It was arranged, however, that he should not join his post before the King had accepted the Constitution, which the National Assembly expected to finish before the end of the winter. Having left the Hôtel de la Guerre, we went to live in the house of my aunt, Madame Denine, Rue de Varennes, near the Rue de Bac. She had had transported here all the furniture from the Rue de Verneuil, where she had given up her lease. This house was very convenient. We lived there with my sister-in-law, Madame de la Mette, with her two children, and my father-in-law. My husband kept the saddle horses and a coupé horse for himself. My father-in-law did not wish to have any carriage. He kept only two carriage horses for my sister-in-law and myself. Madame de la Mette hardly ever went out in the evening, but she went every morning to the sittings of the assembly, which were held in the riding school of the Tuileries. The National Assembly had taken up its quarters in this place at the time it was transferred from Versailles to Paris. I occasionally went to meetings which I thought would interest me, but not regularly, like my sister-in-law. My mornings were employed more usefully. I had a master of design, one of singing, one for Italian, and if the weather was good I rode horseback from three o'clock to nightfall. When my cousin Sheldon was able to accompany me I went to the Bois de Boulogne, but more often I went by the Plaine de Grenelle to the Bois de Meudon. In those days I rode a thoroughbred, who was very lively, and whose manners pleased me very much, but it was difficult to manage him in the Bois de Boulogne, because he would not allow another horse before him, and was always ready to run away. In the spring of 1791, my husband made his preparations to leave for Holland. We packed up our effects, and our boxes were sent to Rotterdam by sea. We sold our saddle horses and set out with our son and his nurse for Anoncourt, where my sister-in-law was staying. Monsieur de la Tour du Pain came to pass some time there, and then returned to Paris to finish up his business. At Paris, he was informed by Monsieur Montmorin 
that the king did not wish him to leave for his post until the day after the constitution which was to be presented to him had received the royal sanction my husband therefore remained at paris i went to rejoin him for several days to see the indecent funeral procession of voltaire when his remains were taken to the pantheon i was living quietly at enancourt with my sister-in-law when my negro servant zamore entered my room at about nine o'clock one morning in a state of great excitement he informed me that two strangers had passed in front of the gate who stated that the evening before the king his children the queen and madame elizabeth had left paris and that it was not known where they had gone this news troubled me very much and i wished to speak with these men i ran to the gate of the court but they had already disappeared and no one knew what had become of them my anxiety was very great as i was afraid that my husband might be compromised Therefore I decided to send Zamor to Paris as a courier to obtain some definite news. An hour later he set up, but before he returned, I received by mail a word from my husband, which confirmed the news. My brother-in-law returned from Amiens, where he was at the time, and we passed two days in a state of agitation which nothing can describe. Ignorant of the outcome of this adventure, the days seemed like centuries. My brother-in-law would not allow us to go to Amiens for fear that they might close the city gates, and that we would not be able to return to the country. We hoped that the king had passed the frontier, but we did not dare to calculate the effect that this event would cause in Paris. My anxiety for my husband was intense but I did not dare go to rejoin him, because he had forbidden me to do so. On the third day at evening, we learned by a man who had come from Amiens that the king had been arrested and taken back as a prisoner to Paris. An hour later, Zamor arrived, bringing a long letter from my husband, who was in despair. I will not attempt to relate the details of this unfortunate flight so badly organised. The memoirs of the time have recounted all the circumstances. This whole affair, originated by Monsieur Fersen, who was a fool, was one succession of mistakes and imprudences. It was only after a seclusion of two months that the King decided to accept the constitution which had been presented to him my husband had drawn up a long memorandum written entirely in his own hand but not signed in which he implored the king to refuse to sign this memorandum which was handed by my husband personally to the king was found after the tenth of august in the famous amois de fer the king had written at the top handed me by monsieur g to advise me to refuse the constitution Later, it was generally supposed that the initial was that of Monsieur Gouvion, who was killed in one of the first combats of the war. After the acceptance of the Constitution, during the session of the Legislative Assembly, there were several months of respite, and I am persuaded that if war had not been declared, if the émigrés had returned as the King seemed to desire, the excesses of the Revolution would have been arrested. But the king and queen believed in the good faith of the powers. Every party was deceived, and France saw and found glory in the defence of its territory. As Napoleon said to Sears, Si j'avais été à la place de Lafayette, le roi serait encore sur le trône, et vous, l'abbé, vous seriez trop heureux de me dire la messe. We set out for The Hague at the beginning of October, 1791. My sister-in-law accompanied us with her two sons and their tutor. My sister-in-law's health was very bad, for the consumption of which she died the following year had already made much progress. As she was very fond of society, the thought of spending the winter alone at Enoncourt was insupportable. 
she no longer had an establishment at Paris. Until the revolution she had lived with her whole family at the Hôtel de la Mette, rue de Notre-Dame-des-Champs. There the mother of the four La Mette brothers, who was a sister of Maréchal de Bonny, had brought up her children. The Maréchal had placed the boys in four different regiments, and the three youngest had taken part with distinction in the American War, in which one of them, Charles, had been severely wounded. My husband's brother-in-law, the eldest of the four, had retired to the country, after having resigned as colonel of the regiment of the Coran Infanterie. The second brother, Theodore, also left the army, and is still living at the time these lines are written, 1841. The third, Charles, had married Mademoiselle Picot, the only daughter and heir of a planter of Saint-Domingue, and lived at Bayonne. In 1787 the French embassy had been driven from Holland, and the Comte de Saint-Priest had retired to Antwerp. France was only represented at The Hague by a chargé d'affaires, Monsieur Caillat, who was a consummate diplomat. He was very useful to my husband, who until then had never occupied himself with diplomacy except in reading history, which was his favourite study. When we arrived at The Hague in the month of October 1791, the start holder was at Berlin, where he had gone to attend the marriage of his eldest son to the young Princess of Prussia. He returned to The Hague several months later, and then there began a series of fates, balls and suppers and diversions of every kind, which were very pleasant for my twenty-one years. I had brought many elegant things with me from France and I soon became very much in vogue. They tried to copy me in everything. I danced very well, and my success at the balls was very great. I enjoyed it like a child. No thought of the morrow bothered me. At all the social reunions I was the first. The Princesse d'Orange did not object to being dressed like me, and to have her hair dressed by my valet de chambre. In short, this life of success, which was to last so short a time, intoxicated me. When du Maurier was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs in the month of March 1792, his first care was to avenge himself for I know not what personal discontent which had been caused him by my father-in-law during the time he was minister. He therefore recalled my husband under the false pretext that he had not shown sufficient firmness in demanding reparation for a pretended insult made to the national flag of France. As soon as we received the news of our recall, we at once leased a pretty little unfurnished house for ourselves, my sister-in-law and her children. She did not wish to return to France, and preferred to remain with me at The Hague. During the day, all the furniture which belonged to us, and which we did not wish to sell, was transported to this house. The rest of our effects, as well as the wines, the service of porcelain, the horses and carriages, remained at the Hôtel de France, to be placed on sale after the arrival of the new minister, in case he did not wish to acquire them from us. As my husband had no secretary of legation, because Monsieur Caille had been sent to Petersburg as chargé d'affaires, he placed the archives in the hands of his own private secretary, who was none other than Monsieur Combe, my former instructor. Monsieur de La Tour du Pin then left for England to see my father, who had just arrived there, in order to persuade him to rejoin us at The Hague. From there he went to Paris, whence he wrote me by every mail, letters which were more and more alarming. Monsieur de Mould, who had been appointed minister to The Hague, arrived at his post about the 10th of August, and was very badly received. No one paid any visits to him except the ambassador of England, which power was not yet at war with France. He did not wish to buy any of our effects, and sent his secretary to notify me of his refusal to allow us to have the auction sale of our things held in the salons of the ground floor of the Hôtel de France. As the weather was fine, I obtained permission to have the sale of our things held upon the Petit Fouart, a charming promenade before the door of the embassy. 
this auction was an event at the hague all my friends were present and the smallest things were sold at a very high price i received a sum of money which was more than double what everything had cost us the proceeds of the sale were put in the hands of monsieur moliere a trustworthy dutch banker he took care of the money and later on sent it to me in america End of part one chapter twelve a chapter twelve part two of recollections of the revolution and the empire this is a librivox recording or librivox recordings are in the public domain madame denis my aunt had emigrated to england and was very anxious to have me come there and join her but the health of my sister-in-law was visibly declining and i did not wish to leave her on the other hand my father-in-law was thinking of joining us in holland my husband had passed several days at the hague between the tenth of august and the massacres of september seventeen ninety two then his father recalled him to london to be with him during the last days of november seventeen ninety two the convention adopted a decree against the emigres and fixed a short term in which they could return to france under pain of confiscation my excellent father-in-law was in england and was thinking of joining us at the hague where his daughter and i were awaiting him with impatience but the news of this decree changed his plans he wrote us that he was not willing to injure the interests of his children on account of any personal consideration and that he should return to paris i do not know why i neglected to speak of the flight of messieurs de lafayette alexandre de lamette and de la tour maubourg all three secretly left the corps d'armee commanded by monsieur de lafayette to pass into foreign territory with a foolish confidence which it would be difficult to explain having presented themselves at the advance posts of the austrians they were at once arrested the austrians wished to use them as hostages to guarantee the safety of the king and his family who had been confined in the temple since the day of the tenth of august Monsieur Alexandre de la Mette had permission to write to his sister-in-law, who was then with me at The Hague, as I have already said, in order to ask for money. Monsieur de Lafayette, for his part, wrote to Mr. Short, the American minister at The Hague. A man named Dulon, who had been for many years in the service of the French legation, had undertaken to arrange the escape of Monsieur de Lafayette, who was imprisoned at Liège, for this purpose it was necessary for him to have at least twenty five thousand francs mr short although he was a rich man refused to advance the sum accordingly m lafayette was transferred with his two companions to the prison of olmitz where he remained until the treaty of campo formio october seventeen ninety seven at the end of the terror madame de lafayette went to vienna accompanied by her two daughters and obtained permission from the emperor of austria to be shut up at olmitz with her husband and to undergo all the rigours of his fate almost by a miracle she had escaped the scaffold upon which perished on the same day twenty second of july seventeen ninety four her grandmother her mother and her sister in her voluntary captivity she showed a resignation and a courage which only religion could have inspired nevertheless she had never been treated by her husband except with the most cruel indifference and she certainly could not have forgotten the numerous infidelities of which he had been guilty my father commanded the corps d'armee established in camp between quesnois and valenciennes at the news of the events of the month of august seventeen ninety two at paris the attack on the tuileries and the overthrow of the monarchy he had addressed an order of the day to the troops prescribing the renewal of the oath of fidelity to the king which he himself took at the same time the result of this noble profession of faith was his removal 
the 23rd of August, 1792, with the order to report at Paris. My endeavours to prevent this remained fruitless, and my fears were only too well justified. I have always reproached myself because I did not go to find him and force him to return with me to The Hague. God had decided otherwise. Poor father. He perished on the scaffold, 13th of April, 1794. As I owned a house at Paris, occupied by the Swedish ambassador, and had an income from the state or from the city of Paris, my husband was afraid that my name would be put on the list of emigres which was about to appear. He therefore sent to me at The Hague a very faithful valet de chambre to accompany me on my return to Paris, and charged him to tell me that I would find at the Belgian frontier, several leagues from Antwerp, a former aide-de-camp of my father provided with an order to secure my safety, and that this man would escort me, if necessary. I made my adieu to my poor sister-in-law, who died two months later, and set out in company with my son, aged two years and a half, my faithful Marguerite, a valet de chambre, and my negro, Samour. The winter, which had just commenced, rendered the journey very disagreeable. The first day of December 1792, buried in the back of an excellent berline, well enveloped with furs and bearskins, I left The Hague to pass the first night, I think, at Gorkum. During the whole day we heard the noise of cannon. My valet de chambre thought that this noise must come from the French who were besieging the city of Antwerp, but it would take them a long time to capture the city, as the garrison was very strong, and the city well provisioned. The next day at Breda, a city situated also in Holland, there was the same noise of cannonade. As no alarming news was published, I set out nevertheless without fear, and found at the Austrian frontier of the Low Countries Monsieur Schnetz, a brave officer and a friend of my father's, whose presence gave me great pleasure. Arrived there the evening before, he had been astonished to hear that there was no news from Antwerp. He said laughingly, but without really believing it, that perhaps the city had been taken. However, about midday, the noise of the cannon having ceased, he then declared that this rampart of the Austrian power had capitulated, which was indeed true. On arriving at the French post at the exterior gate of the city, we learned that the French were masters of this great fortress. On arriving at the Hôtel du Grand Laboureur upon the large Place Mer, we had much trouble in obtaining a room. It was only due to the intervention of a general, whose name escapes me, that an officer gave up for me the room in which he was already installed, from which he had his baggage taken out with rather bad grace. In the morning, Monsieur Schnetz informed me that we must set out for Mons, where we were to pass the night, as had been arranged. I was so upset by the events of the previous day that I did not venture to request the privilege of passing the next night at Brussels, which would have permitted me to see my aunt, Lady Jerningham, who was then in this city with her daughter. It was therefore arranged that we should only change horses at Brussels. In leaving Antwerp, I was struck by the originality of a spectacle new to me. Between the advance lines of the fortifications and the first post at Contich, we passed through the entire French army which was in bivouac there. These conquerors, who had already caused the armies of Austria and Prussia to tremble, had all the appearance of a horde of bandits. The greater part were without uniforms. The convention had had manufactured in haste for the soldiers caps of cloth of the most varied colours, for which they had requisitioned the material from all the shops of Paris and the large cities. The officers only were in uniform, but their uniforms had none of the brilliant embroideries of which Napoleon later on was so prodigal. Forced to go almost at a walk, 
the route to me appeared very long. The highways had been cut up by the artillery and were encumbered by wagons, caissons and cannon. We proceeded slowly in the midst of the cries and oaths of the charretiers and the gross pleasantries of the soldiers. I saw that Schnetz was disturbed and that he regretted that we had not taken an escort. Finally, at nightfall, we reached Madin, where we passed the night quietly, although there were still many troops. The following morning we set out for Brussels, where we were to pass through without stop. But Monsieur de Chabrion, commandant of the city, thought otherwise. At the moment that the horses were ready, and after Schnetz had already had our passports feast, there arrived an order from the general that I should be detained. The horses were unhitched, and when I wished to descend from the carriage to look for a shelter in the Maison de Poste, I found sentinels placed at the two doors of the carriage who prevented me. Schnetz immediately went to the general headquarters to demand the reason for this vexatious delay. Finally, at the end of three hours, the general authorised my departure without having condescended to explain this singular abuse of authority. He was a man of the world whom I had met a hundred times in society, without ever having spoken to him. He was very short-sighted and had a very revolutionary spirit. I was not yet at the end of my alarms. On arriving late at Mons, we had much trouble in finding a lodging. All the inns were full. At last, in one place, we succeeded in finding two little rooms for my maid and myself, which were located in a very low first story looking out upon the street. The officers who had occupied them had just left. Schnetz and my two domestics were to sleep at the end of a very large court, so that my maid and I were separated from them. This arrangement was very far from pleasing me, but it was necessary to submit. I therefore lay down on my bed without undressing. During the night I was disturbed and alarmed by officers who endeavoured to enter my room. The following morning, shortly after our departure, we met an escadron composed entirely of negroes, all of whom were well mounted and perfectly equipped. They were commanded by the handsome negro of the Duc d'Orléans, Egalité. His name was Edouard, and he was well acquainted with my negro, Zamour, who asked my permission to spend the day with his friends. I was afraid that they would endeavour to persuade him to join them, and that I should never see him again, but I was mistaken. This worthy fellow was very well treated by his comrades during the day, but at night he rejoined me. The remainder of my journey passed without any circumstances worthy of being reported. Monsieur Schnetz left me at Peronne, and I continued my route to Enoncourt, where I found my brother-in-law, the Marquis de la Mette. End of Part 1, Chapter 12b Part 1, Chapter 13 of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1793. Flight to Bordeaux. I arrived very late at Enoncourt, where, as already stated, I found my brother-in-law. He was very much depressed over his personal situation and was well satisfied that his wife and children were out of France. It was arranged that I should stop only twenty-four hours at Enoncourt in order to take the papers which would permit me to reach Paris in safety, among others an attestation of my sojourn at Enoncourt since the recall of Monsieur de la Tour du Pin. My hope that my husband would be able to meet me was disappointed, for already it was both difficult and dangerous to travel in France. Not only was a passport necessary, but to obtain this, it was essential to be accompanied by sureties who, upon their own responsibility, testified that you were not going in a direction different from that indicated. Besides this, in order to enter the environs of Paris, it was necessary to be fortified with a carte de sûreté, 
of which each post of the National Guard had the right to demand the production. In short, a thousand little vexations added to the great ones rendered a sojourn in France insupportable. I therefore set out alone from Enoncourt and arrived without trouble at Passy the following day. The maître de poste of Saint-Denis commenced by refusing peremptorily to conduct me to Passy, where I wished to go, under the pretext that as my passport was for Paris, it was necessary to conduct me there by the shortest route. After an hour of conferences and explanations, during the course of which I was afraid of compromising myself, as I was not used to this sort of thing, my valet de chambre had the happy thought of showing his own carte de sûreté for Passy, and upon the payment of an extra sum they allowed us to leave. At Passy I finally rejoined my husband, who was established in a house belonging to Madame de Poix. As this dwelling was too large for our household, we were enabled to close the windows on the street, thus giving the idea that the house was uninhabited. We entered by the small door used by the concierge. The house had two or three other exits, and therefore constituted a good refuge, especially as it was the last dwelling of the village on the side of Auteuil, which enabled us easily to join my father-in-law, who had been settled in this last-named locality since his return from England. The house which he occupied was named La Tuilerie. It was isolated and situated between Auteuil and Passy. Fortunately, we could go there by byways, where we never encountered anyone. An old cabriolet and wretched horse conducted us to Paris without the necessity of letting the public coachman into the secret of our retreat. Every day after our déjeuner, I went to Paris with my husband, who was occupied with his own affairs and those of his father. We nearly always took our dinner in the city, either with my father or with Madame de Montesson, whose house was always open to us. My father, who was living in a furnished hotel in the Chaussée d'Antin, was giving all his time to the service of the king, endeavouring to organise the party which was later known as the Girondins. To them he pointed out that their best interests lay in preserving the life of the king, of arranging his escape from Paris, and then of guarding him as a hostage in some city of the interior where he would not be able to communicate either with foreign powers or with the royalists who were then commencing to organise in the Vendée. But the party of terrorists was too strong for any human efforts to thwart its terrible intentions. My unfortunate father made his strongest efforts with Dumouriez, who came to Paris about the middle of January, but was deceived by the latter with vain promises. De Maurier was entirely committed to the party of Egalité and his son, of whom he boasted that he was the military tutor. His trip to Paris had no other end than that of serving the Orléans princes. I will not attempt to relate all of this series of anxieties and discouragements through which we passed in the month of January 1793. These events belong to the domain of history might have been related by the historians in the light of their own opinions. My only idea is to clear the memory of my father from the odious imputations with which they have not hesitated to tarnish his honourable character. He only saw the judges of Louis the Sixteenth with the hope of saving, if not the liberty, the life of the king. And the very morning of his sentence he thought it certain that a vote of imprisonment until the end of the war was assured. During this memorable meeting, we remained at home in a state of anxiety which no words can express. When the sentence was known, and we had left my father, we still hoped that an insurrection would break out. The morning of the 21st of January, the gates of Paris were closed, with orders to make no reply to those who demanded the reason. We understood the meaning of this only too well, and my husband and I, leaning out of the window of our house which overlooked Paris, 
listened for the sound of musketry which would bring to us the hope that so great a crime would not be committed without opposition in a state of stupor we hardly dared to address a word to each other alas the greatest silence continued to reign in the regicidal city at half past ten the gates were opened and everything resumed its ordinary course a great nation had stained its annals with a crime for which the centuries would reproach it and not even the course of life had been changed we set out on foot for paris and taking care not to traverse the place louis quinze we went to the house of my father then to that of madame de montesson and later to madame de poix returning at an early hour to passy we found at our house Mathieu de Montmorency and the Abbé de Damas. Both of them had been on the place of execution with their battalion of the National Guard. Having compromised themselves by some remarks, they had left Paris from the fear of being arrested, and had come to demand that we should conceal them until they could leave or return home. They were afraid of a visite domiciliaire, the first sign of trouble which generally preceded by some months the arrest of people who were suspected. In these visits, papers of every kind were seized and taken to the section, where often the most secret correspondence served as a pastime for the young members of the National Guard who were on duty that day. About the middle of March, my father-in-law was arrested at La Tuilerie and conducted to the Commune of Paris. After answering many questions, he was released. Being more disturbed over the fate of his son than over his own danger, he decided that we ought to retire to Le Bouil, whence my husband would be able to reach Vendée, or with us to escape to Spain. This plan seemed more feasible, as our excellent friend Monsieur de Bouquin had been living at Bordeaux during the past year, in this city, as food director, he was in charge of the supplies for our army, which was waging war in Spain. We therefore resolved to set out. I left my father with the most profound emotion, though I was far from thinking that I was embracing him for the last time. The difference between our ages, hardly nineteen years, was so little that he seemed to me more like a brother than like a father. He had an aquiline nose, a very small mouth, large black eyes, and light chestnut hair. His tall figure, his handsome face, and his superb form gave him all the appearance of youth. No one could have had more noble manners, nor a greater air of grand seigneur. He was my best friend, and at the same time the comrade of my husband. My father-in-law was impatient to have us far from Paris, and urged us to set out as soon as possible. The first day of April, 1793, we were on our way. It had been decided that we should make short journeys on account of the state of my health. We arrived at Le Bouil towards the middle of April, and I experienced great joy in finding myself in this place so dear to my poor father-in-law. He had diminished his fortune by the embellishments which he had made and by the buildings which he had constructed. The four months which we passed there have remained in my memory and above all in my heart as the pleasantest of my life. There was a fine library, and my husband, who could read for hours without fatigue, consecrated our evenings to a course of history and literature which was as interesting as it was instructive. Our happiness was without a cloud, and more complete than at any other moment of our past life together. The city of Bordeaux, controlled by the Girondins, was in a state of semi-revolt against the Convention. Many of the Royalists had taken part in the hope of leading the departments of the Midi, and above all those of the Gironde, to join in the movement which had broken out in the departments of the West. But Bordeaux was far from possessing the energetic courage of the Vendée. 
there had been organized in the city an armed troop of eight hundred or one thousand young men of the first families the instigators of this movement had only one end in view namely to declare their independence of paris and of the convention and establish on the model of the united states a federal government in the south of france monsieur de la tour du pin went to bordeaux where he saw the chiefs of this projected federation and returned disgusted with his interview at the end of the summer we began to be disturbed by the municipality of saint andre de cubsac the possibility of a visite domiciliaire or the establishment of a garrison in the chateau frightened my husband my father-in-law had just been arrested seals had been placed upon the chateau of tesson near saint and the department of charente inferieure had arbitrarily taken possession for their officers of the fine mansion which we possessed at saint under these conditions it seemed to us prudent to accept the proposition of our excellent friend monsieur de bourquin to go and settle in a small house which he possessed at a quarter of a league from bordeaux this house named canol offered every kind of security it was isolated in the middle of a vineyard surrounded on three sides by parish roads leading in different directions and on the fourth side by an extensive moor no village was to be found in the environs and all this part of the country called aubryon comprised an agglomeration of properties larger or smaller planted with vines and almost all contiguous accordingly on the first of september seventeen ninety three we went to establish ourselves at canot here monsieur de boucan came to dine with us every day if it had not been for the delicate state of my health we would have perhaps set out for spain admitting however that this departure was possible it would have been necessary for us to pass through the entire french army the morning of the thirteenth of september the revolutionary army entered bordeaux less than an hour later all the federal chiefs were arrested and imprisoned the revolutionary tribune immediately began its sessions and during a period of six months there was not a day passed which did not see the death of some innocent person a guillotine was permanently established upon the place dauphine during the course of these events was born my little girl who was named seraphine after her father an hour after her birth my husband was obliged to leave us to seek a place of safety monsieur de bouquin had hardly returned to his house in bordeaux when they came to arrest him and conduct him to prison he protested that he was charged with the details of the administration of the supplies for the army fighting in spain that his arrest would greatly compromise the service and in consequence would be strongly disapproved of by the general-in-chief these good reasons determined the representatives of the people to place him under arrest in his own house it was indeed a kind of imprisonment because he was not able to go out but he had the liberty of a house which was very large with several means of escape in case the danger became too imminent the twenty-five men of the garde bourgeoise stationed at his door were almost all from his quarter and under some kind of obligation to him his goodness and kindness were very great and he was adored in bordeaux it was necessary however for him to board these twenty-five men the whole time that he was under arrest which was during the greater part of the winter every day the guards were changed the night following the arrest of monsieur de bouquin about midnight when he was about to go to bed a municipal officer followed by the chief of his section and several guards presented themselves at his house and summoned him to follow them to canot where they wished to examine his papers his trouble and embarrassment were extreme he knew that my name my rank in the world the situation of my father-in-law who had just been confronted with the queen at paris 
with so many motives for proscription. My fate seemed to him certain, and he was in despair in thinking of my husband, who had confided me to his care, and whom he tenderly loved. He could not think of any means of avoiding the fate with which I seemed to be menaced. Fortunately, among the members of his guards, there was one who was very much attached to him. Divining his perplexity, of his own accord, he came to give the alarm. I was sleeping quietly when suddenly I felt myself shaken by a faithful old woman who in tears and as pale as death cried, Here are the coupe tete who are coming to search and attach the seals. We're all lost. In saying these words, she pushed under my pillow a large packet and disappeared as suddenly as she had come. I felt of the package and recognised that it was a sack containing five or six hundred louis of which Monsieur de Boucan had spoken to me and which he kept in reserve in case of urgent necessity either for himself or for Monsieur de la Tour du Pin or me. This bag of money was not reassuring. Nevertheless, I did not dare in taking it from its hiding place to let it be seen by the girl who was caring for my child. Not only was I suspicious of her, but the physician had discovered that she was playing the role of a spy. A half hour later, the visitors arrived. After carefully examining the exterior of the house, they entered the salon. The blood froze in my veins when I thought of all the dangers to which I was exposed. Every moment I expected to hear a hand placed on my door. Finally, I distinctly heard someone ask, Who was in this room? Monsieur de Brucain replied in a whisper, and I could not hear the words. Later he explained to me that the inspiration had come to him to state that a young girl whom some friends had confided to him was in the room and that she was in a delicate condition and very ill. No one entered my room, and at the end of two hours, after having drunk and eaten everything there was in the house, they went away, taking their prisoner with them. I remained alone at Canol with my worthy physician, who commenced to feel reassured, although all danger had not passed. Every evening, upon my request, the good doctor read the papers to me. The news then was something terrible, and became even more so for me, when we found the report of the confrontation of my worthy father-in-law with the Queen. In these reports was described the wrath of fouquier Tinville, when Monsieur de la Tour du Pin continued to name her the Queen, or Her Majesty, instead of Femme Capet, as the public prosecutor wished. My fear reached its height when I learned that, in answer to the question as to where his son was, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin had replied with simplicity that he was on his estate near Bordeaux. The result of this reply was an order sent the same day to Saint-André de Cubsac to arrest my husband and to send him to Paris. He was at Le Bouil, and there was only an hour to save him. Fortunately, in anticipation of this eventuality, and under the pretext of having a farm to visit, he kept quite a good horse ready in the stable. Disguising himself as well as possible, he set out with the intention of gaining the estate at Tesson near to Saint, and concealing himself in the chateau. The house was under sequestration, but was in charge of an excellent caretaker and his wife. He was not short of money, as he had from 10,000 to 12,000 francs in Assignat. He rode all night long. The weather was terrible. The rain fell in torrents and the thunder did not cease to rumble. The flashes of lightning blinded and frightened his horse, who was quite a lively beast. In leaving saint genis upon the route from Blay to Saint, a man who was standing before a small house addressed him, What weather, citizen? Would you like to enter and let the storm pass? Monsieur de la Tour du Pain consented. He dismounted and tied his horse to a little shed, situated 
fortunately for him, as you will see later on, very near to the door. He entered the house, where he found an old man occupying the corner of the fireplace. A quarter of an hour passed in conversation upon the dearness of grains and cattle. At this point, the individual who had been seated near the fire issued from the house and returned ten minutes later wearing a scarf. It was the mayor. Citizen, you undoubtedly have a passport, he said to my husband. Why, certainly, replied the latter. No one travels without that. So saying, my husband produced a false passport in the name of Gouvernet, of which he had made use in going and coming between Saint-André and Bordeaux. But, declared the mayor after examination, your passport has no visé to go to Charente Inférieure. Remain here until morning. I will consult the municipal council. Then he resumed his place. My husband felt that he was lost if he did not take his courage in both hands. During this conversation, the master of the house, who appeared to be very much bored, had approached the opened door, and now remarked in a loud tone, as though speaking to himself, Ah! The weather has all cleared up. My husband at that time was only thirty-four years of age, was extremely quick, and could rival in point of address the most practised horseman. After hearing the above remark of the master of the house, he arose quietly and approached the door, which had remained open. Extending his arm out in the obscurity of the night, he unfastened the bridle of his horse. In a single bound he was on the back of the horse, and putting the spurs to him had escaped, before the poor mare had had the time to leave his seat behind the fire and reach the door of the house. Monsieur de la Tour du Pin did not dare to pass through Pons, where there was a fair during the day. He stopped at Mirambeau, with the former groom of his father, who inhabited this locality and in whom he had confidence. This man had a little inn, and conducted a stage which went to Saint once a week. Tetard, which was his name, offered to conceal him, but he had young children, and was afraid of their indiscretion. He therefore proposed to my husband to demand an asylum with his brother-in-law, a rich locksmith, who was married, but had no children. The latter consented, upon the payment of quite a large sum, and the bargain was concluded. My husband was hidden at the house in a closet without windows connected with the bedroom, which was also used as a kitchen. I have since visited this horrible hole. A thin flooring alone separated it from the shop where the employé worked, and where were situated the forge and bellows. When the locksmith and his wife left their room, they always took away the key, and it was necessary for my husband to remain stretched upon his bed and not make the slightest noise. They had also recommended to him not to have any light, from fear that it might be perceived from without. But as soon as the shop was closed, my husband descended to supper with the man and his wife. The groom often brought news, frequently newspapers and also books, which he went to Tesson to obtain. It was in this way that my poor husband passed the first three months of our separation. The postmaster of Saint, upon whose devotion he could count, advised him to go to Vendée. But aside from the extreme difficulty of passing through the lines of the Republican troops, my husband was not willing to go there under an assumed name, and by rejoining openly the Vendée he would have only made certain the death of his father and myself. End of part one, chapter thirteen. Part one, chapter fourteen of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Seventeen ninety three to seventeen ninety four. Life at Bordeaux. 
a memorandum had been presented to the municipality of saint andre de cubzac going to show that the estate of le bouille was a royal domain without any further information the commissioners were sent to le bouille where they placed the seals with such prodigality that there was not a single door which could be opened however an excellent girl whom i had left at the chateau had already concealed the most valuable effects which i had there in the way of linen and so forth and brought them to me at bordeaux each week in small packets about this time i began to fear that my prolonged sojourn with monsieur de bouquin was attracting too much attention above all i feared that my presence at his house would end by compromising him this situation was often the subject of my conversations with a relative of monsieur de bouquin monsieur de chambeau who was himself suspected and obliged to hide he had found a very retired place of refuge with an individual who kept a little obscure hotel place puy paulin this individual young and active a widower with a single child whom he had confided to his mother-in-law lived entirely alone in this hotel with a single domestic this man whose name was bonny pretended to be a furious demagogue he wore a vest of coarse plush called camagnole sabot and a sabre he went to the meetings of the section to the jacobins club and vowed every one Monsieur de Chambeau spoke to him of my anxieties. I did not know where I could retire. My husband was in flight. My father and father-in-law were prisoners. My house had been seized. And my only friend, Monsieur de Bourcon, was under arrest at his own house. At twenty-four years of age, with two little children, what was to become of me? Bonny came to see me at Canole, and was interested in my sad situation. He proposed that I take refuge with him. His house was vacant, and M. Bocan advised me not to reject his offer. I therefore accepted. He gave me an apartment which was very sombre and very dilapidated, with an outlook upon a little garden. Here I installed myself with my two children, their nurse, and my dear Marguerite, who was continually tormented by a fever which nothing seemed to cure. My dear Gros Amour passed for a free black who was awaiting the moment to join the army. The location of my own apartment enabled me to enjoy my music without the danger of being overheard. As I was alone a great deal of the time, this was a great distraction for me. I knew a very good music teacher named Ferrari, of Italian origin, who had stated and also proved to me that he was an agent of the royal princes. He was very spiritual and original, and had much talent. My room, which was quite large, was reached through a kind of wood house in which I had had piled up a large lot of wood which had been brought from Le Bouille, unknown to the guardian there. This wood was brought by our peasants, who took it in my interest. A woman of the country who was entirely devoted to us also came to Bordeaux twice a week to sell vegetables. She led a donkey which bore panniers half full of linen and clothing which were covered with cabbages and potatoes. She was adroit enough to make the employé of the octroi believe that these objects had been taken from the enemies of the people. Sometimes she made them a present of some articles and brought the rest to me my husband found a means of writing to me by a boy who came to bordeaux each week his letter which was without address was concealed in a loaf of bread which the child brought to the place puy paulin ostensibly for the nurse as he arrived at a fixed hour the cook awaited him at the time of high tide this poor child fifteen years of age was ignorant of the subterfuge they had simply told him that there was a nurse in the house whom the physician had forbidden to eat the bread of the section. This pain de section was composed of all kinds of flour, was black and sticky, and one would hesitate now to give it even to the dogs. 
it was delivered hot from the furnace and every one was forced to place himself in line to obtain it it was a very singular thing however that the people found a sort of pleasure in this assemblage as the terror under which they lived hardly permitted them to exchange a word with those whom they met in the street this queue represented so to speak an authorised meeting where they could speak with their neighbours and learn the news without being exposed to the imprudence of a question i do not recall under what circumstances all the english and american merchants residing at bordeaux were arrested this measure gave me the well-founded fear of being taken for an englishwoman which had often happened bunny was seriously alarmed and advised me no longer to wear a hat when i went out during the day but to dress myself like the women of bordeaux this idea of disguise was not disagreeable i ordered some brassieres which were well suited to my form very slight at that time and which with the red handkerchief upon my head changed me so completely that i encountered people of my acquaintance without being recognised monsieur de Bourcon, who was still in confinement was very much amused at the comments of his twenty-five guardians upon the daily visits which he received from the belle grisette nevertheless my position at bordeaux became more perilous from day to day and i cannot understand how i escaped death i was advised to endeavour to have the sequestre of le bruit raised but any manifestation of my existence seemed to me too dangerous and i was in a state of the most desperate uncertainty when providence sent me a special protection madame de fontenay who was then called theresia cabarus arrived at bordeaux four years before i had met her once at paris madame Schrat de la Mette, with whom she had been a pupil in a convent pointed her out to me one evening in coming out of the theatre she did not seem to me at the time to be more than fourteen or fifteen years of age and only left in my mind the remembrance of a child it was said that she had divorced her husband to preserve her fortune but it was rather to use and abuse her liberty having met talien at the baths of the pyrenees he had rendered her some kind of service of which i am ignorant which she had rewarded with an unlimited devotion which she took no pains to disguise she had come to bordeaux to rejoin him and was quartered at the hotel d'angleterre on the day following her arrival i wrote her the following note a lady who has met madame de fontenay at paris and who knows that she is as good as she is beautiful requests a moment of interview she replied verbally that this lady could come whenever she wished a half hour later i was at her door when i entered she came to me and looking me in the face cried Dieu, madame de gouvernet then having embraced me with effusion she put herself at my service this was her expression i explained to her my situation she considered it more dangerous than i had thought it myself and declared that the only means of saving myself was to fly as soon as possible i told her that i could not make up my mind to leave without my husband she said you must see tanian he will advise you as to the course to adopt you will be safe here as soon as he knows that you are the object of my interest i determined to solicit from tanian the lifting of the sequest of le bouis in the name of my children also the permission to retire there with them then i left her with a feeling of confidence from the interest she had shown and at the same time asking myself why she was interested in me madame de fontenay was then not more than twenty years of age a more beautiful human being had never issued from the hands of the creator she was a perfect woman 
all her features bore the imprint of the most regular and artistic perfection her hair black as ebony seemed made of the finest silk and nothing detracted from the brilliancy of her complexion which was clear as ivory an enchanting smile displayed the most admirable teeth her tall form recalled that of diane chasseresse the least movements revealed an incomparable grace while her voice which was harmonious and slightly marked with a foreign accent exercised a charm which no words can express you could not help feeling sad when you thought it so much youth beauty grace and spirit was abandoned to the man who every morning signed the death warrant of many innocent persons the following morning i received from madame de fontenay this message this evening at ten o'clock i passed the day in a state of agitation difficult to describe arming myself with all my courage at nine o'clock i took the arm of monsieur de chambeau who was more alarmed than myself without daring to show it he conducted me to the door of madame de fontenay where he left me with the promise to walk up and down the boulevard until the moment when i came out Talian had not yet arrived and the moment of waiting was full of anguish madame de fontenay could not talk with me as there were several persons present whom i did not know finally we heard the carriage and it was impossible to be mistaken for it was the only one which rolled in the streets of this large city madame de fontenay went out and returned in a moment she took my hand saying he waits you if she had announced to me that the executioner was there i could not have had a different feeling she opened a door upon a little passageway at the end of which i saw a lighted room as i hesitated involuntarily madame de fontenay gave me a push in the back and said go ahead do not act like a child then she turned and went away closing the door it was necessary for me to advance but i did not dare raise my eyes nevertheless i walked to the corner of the chimney-piece upon which were two lighted candles without the support of the marble i should have fallen Talian was leaning on the other corner he said in a voice that was quite soft what do you wish of me then i stammered the request to be allowed to go to our country estate of le Bouil, and that the seals which had been placed there by error should be taken from the property of my father-in-law with whom i had resided briskly he replied but all this was not of his affair then he said but you are then the daughter-in-law of this man who was confronted with the woman Capet? And you have a father? What is his name? Ha! Huh. Dillon, the general. All the enemies of the Republic will pass like this, he added, making at the same time with his hand the gesture of cutting off a head. I was overcome with indignation, which gave me back all my courage. I raised my eyes to look at this monster whom I had not yet regarded. Before me I saw a man of twenty-five or twenty-six with a fine face, which he endeavoured to render severe. A mass of blonde curls escaped from all sides under a large military hat covered with varnished cloth and surmounted by a tricoloured plume. He was dressed in a long tight overcoat of coarse blue cloth over which hung a sabre by a shoulder-belt which was crossed by a long silk staff of the three colours. "'I have not come here, citizen,' said I, "'to hear the sentence of death of my family, "'and since you cannot accord me what I have demanded, "'I must not trouble you longer.' "'At the same time I gave him a slight salute with my head. "'He smiled, as if to say, you are very rash to talk to me in this manner then i went out by the door by which i had entered without going again to the salon on my return home i felt that my position was aggravated rather than helped 
If Tarian did not help me, my fate appeared to me certain. Towards the middle of the winter, the locksmith with whom my husband was concealed arrived at Bordeaux to purchase iron. He came to see me, and I showed him my appreciation and my confidence. I also let him see my children, so that he would be able to tell their father that he had found them in good health. He was a good peasant of Saintonge, but very simple and ignorant, and understanding nothing of the state of the country. He could not comprehend why they were able to eat excellent white bread at Mirambeau, while that which they had given him that morning at Bordeaux was so black that his dog would have refused it. While waiting for the tide to turn so that he could return to Blaye, he walked in Bordeaux and unfortunately passed the Place Dauphine, where executions were taking place. A lady mounted the scaffold, and he demanded, what was her crime? She is an aristocrat, they replied. Soon he saw a peasant like himself called upon to submit to the same fate. Again he demanded the reason, and it was explained that this man had given asylum to a nobleman, and that for this reason only he was condemned to die with him. The poor man forgot what had brought him to Bordeaux. He set out to return on foot, and on his arrival home during the night he at once announced to my husband that he could not guard him for another hour, as his own life and that of his wife were in danger. He ran to wake up his brother-in-law, the groom, who could not succeed in reassuring him. It was decided that they should attach a horse to a little chariot at the bottom of which they put some straw, in which my husband was concealed. Then they departed through roundabout roads for Tesson, the chateau of my father-in-law upon which the seals had been placed, but to which the concierge Grégoire and his wife had a secret entrance. One of the windows of the pavilion which they occupied looked out upon the road. The groom rapped at a shutter which they opened, and my husband entered by this window and was received by these worthy people with exclamations of pleasure. He was installed in a room adjoining their own, with a chimney in common. This permitted them to have a fire every day without attracting attention without, which was very much appreciated by my husband, who was very chilly. At Tesson there was an excellent library. The inventory of this and also of the furniture of the chateau had not yet been taken. The seals had been placed only upon the exterior doors, so that it was possible to go anywhere in the house as long as the Venetian blinds were not opened. My husband therefore had access to all the books he wished to read. He even found means of withdrawing papers and old correspondence of his father, the publication of which would have been disagreeable. However, he was not destined to enjoy this retreat, which was comparatively comfortable, without trouble. At the end of seven or eight days, orders arrived at the municipality of Tesson that they should at once proceed with the inventory of all that was contained in the chateau, which was large and very well furnished. The father of my husband had inherited this property from Monsieur de Montconseil, his father-in-law, who had lived there for forty years, and had furnished it in a sumptuous and magnificent manner of the time of Louis the Fourteenth. This inventory would take about two days, and it was impossible to expect that any corner of the chateau would escape the vigilance of the visitors. Grégoire did not disguise his fears from my unfortunate husband. He declared that he did not know a place where he could conceal him, or a person in the village or the neighbourhood who would be willing to receive him. It was therefore agreed that Grégoire should go to Saint to see Boucher the postmaster, a former écuyer of Monsieur de Montconseil, who was very much attached to my husband, whom he had known when very young at his grandfather's, and request him to receive the fugitive at his house. Grégoire set out early in the morning, on foot, in very bad weather, although he was over seventy years of age. 
he did not find boucher at home but his sister who was equally devoted to our interests consented to receive my husband and conceal him during the absence of her brother gregoire accordingly returned to tesson without having taken any rest that very night he again set out with my husband for Saint, a locality where there were no walls and which was consequently accessible by byways known to gregoire i have omitted to say before that i had sent my husband during the time he was at mirabeau a complete costume of a peasant of the revolutionary period in which he could hardly recognize himself mademoiselle boucher received him very well but with an exaggeration of precautions from which he drew the conclusion that the shorter the time he remained in the house the better she would like it the inventory at tesson having been finished at the end of three days it was possible for my husband to return end of part one chapter fourteen part one chapter fifteen of recollections of the revolution and the empire this is a librivox recording or librivox recordings are in the public domain chapter fifteen seventeen ninety four decision to leave france however the situation became more alarming from hour to hour not a day passed without executions i was lodged sufficiently near the place dauphine to hear the drum the roll of which marked each head that fell i could count them before the evening papers told me the names of the victims the window of my room looked out on the garden the end of which touched an old church in which was established the club of the amis du peuple and when the evening session was animated the applause and vociferations of the miserable creatures who were present reached even to my room the news which i received to my husband depicted his situation at tesson as most precarious at every moment gregoire was menaced with the establishment in the chateau of a body of troops or a military hospital or something similar which would have obliged my husband to flee again i did not know of any other place where he could be in greater security i could not think of recalling him to bordeaux near me on account of the girl who took care of my child i had been told again that it was impossible to trust her nevertheless i did not dare to send her away for fear of worse another circumstance had proved to me that i was not forgotten at bordeaux as much as i had hoped my man of affairs had written me from paris that a law had just been adopted requiring certificat de residence with nine witnesses and that it was necessary to renew these certificats every three months under pain of the confiscation of the property which you possessed in the communes where you did not reside i had a house at paris occupied by the swedish ambassador and an income from the state which had already been reduced by a third it was therefore necessary for me to obtain this certificate bonny took charge of getting together the nine witnesses none of whom had ever seen me in their lives but who were willing to believe his word by arrangement we went to the municipality one morning here i was seated near the fire while bonny had the act drawn up and obtained the signatures of the witnesses finally the moment for me to sign arrived and the municipal officer with a kind of respect which astonished me gave me a chair to use while signing then to my great alarm the certificate was read from one end to the other in a loud voice and at the name of dillon one of these rascals interrupted by saying aha the citizeness is apparently sister or niece of all the emigres of this name whom we have upon our list i was going to reply in the negative when the head of the bureau said brusquely you do not know what you are talking about she is not even their relative i looked at him in surprise and he said to me in a low tone while giving me the pen to sign you are the niece of the archbishop of narbonne i am from sorez 
I thanked him with a slight inclination of the head, but I thought as I went away that it was necessary to leave Bordeaux since I was so well known. I felt at the end of my resources. I saw that Bonny was disturbed over my fate. Several means of escape had been recognised as impossible. Every day someone was executed who had thought he was in safety. My nights were passed without sleep as I thought at every noise that they were coming to arrest me. I hardly dared any longer to leave the house. I was afraid of falling sick at the moment when I never had greater use for my health, in order to be strong enough to act if this was found necessary. Finally, one morning, going to see Monsieur de Boucan, who was still under arrest at his house, I was leaning pensively upon the table, when my eyes were mechanically drawn to a morning paper which was open. Here I read under the commercial news, The ship Diane of Boston, 150 tons, will leave in eight days in ballast with the permission of the Minister of Marine. Without saying a word, I immediately got up and was leaving when Monsieur de Bourgon raised his eyes and said, Where are you going then so quickly? I am going to America, I replied as I went out. I went directly to see Madame de Fontenay, whom I advised of my resolution. She approved of my plan, especially as she had just had bad news from Paris. Tallien had been denounced there by his colleague, and was likely to be recalled at any moment. This recall, she thought, would probably be the signal for a new outbreak of cruelty at Bordeaux, where she herself did not wish to remain if Tallien left. It was therefore not a moment to lose if we wished to be saved. I returned to my house and called Bonnie, to whom I said that it was necessary to find me a man in whom he had confidence to go in search of my husband. He did not hesitate a moment. He said, The commission is perilous, but I know a man who can undertake it, and that man is myself. He assured me that he would succeed, and I had confidence in his zeal and his intelligence. He hazarded his life, which would have been sacrificed with that of my husband if they had been discovered, but as in this case my own would not have been spared, I did not feel any scruples in accepting his proposition. I did not lose an instant. I went to find an old shipowner, a friend of my father's, who was also a shipbroker. He was very devoted to me and agreed to go and arrange passage on the Diane for myself, my husband and our two children. I should have liked to take Marguerite with me, but for a period of six months already she had had a double intermittent fever, and no remedy seemed to cure her. I was afraid that a sea voyage at this bad season of the year, as we were in the last days of February, might be fatal to her. I therefore resolved to leave without her. When I returned to see Monsieur Bruquin, having already arranged everything, his surprise was very great. He then told me that he had just been restored to liberty by an order from Paris, and that he was counting on leaving in several days. He proposed to me to go the following day to Canol for luncheon, to which place he had not returned since the visite domiciliaire. Once more at my own residence, I placed my confidence in my good Zamor, for the most difficult thing was to arrange to pack our effects without the knowledge of the maid, who would immediately have denounced us to the section. She slept with my little girl, then six months of age, in a long room lined with wardrobes, in which I had placed all the things which had been sent me from Le Bouil, as well as those which I had brought from there myself when I came to take up my residence at Canol. This room was between my own and that of Marguerite. The latter had an exit on a little staircase which descended to the cellar. Fortunately, having no confidence in this maid, I had always kept the wardrobes closed. I therefore arranged with Samoa 
that on the following morning while i was at canole where i would take with me the maid and the children he should get out all my things and take them down to the cellar by the little stairway and there pack them in the boxes which he would find i especially charged him not to leave on the floor even a piece of thread the sight of which might reveal to the maid that the wardrobes had recently been opened he executed this commission with his usual intelligence the next day i went in company with monsieur de chambeau to luncheon at canole at the house of monsieur de Bourcon. while we three were at table the gate of the garden opened and we saw madame de fontenay enter on the arm of talien my surprise was very great as she had not told me of her plan Brockham was stupefied, but soon recovered himself. As for myself, I endeavoured to conceal my emotion at the sight of a man who had entered behind Tallien. He had placed a finger upon his lips on looking at me, and I immediately turned my eyes away. This was Monsieur de Jumelac, whom I knew well, and who, concealed at Bordeaux under another name, accompanied Tallien. The latter, after a polite remark to Brouquin regarding the liberty which he had taken to pass through his garden to go to the house of the Swedish consul, came to me, with the polite bearing of a seigneur of the ancien cour, and said to me in the most gracious manner, I am told, madame, that I am in a position to-day to repair my faults with regard to you. I am entirely at your disposal. Accordingly, laying aside the air of cold disdain which i had formerly assumed towards him with an expression sufficiently polite i explained that having some pecuniary interests at martinique i desired to go there to look after my affairs and that i would like to ask him for a passport for myself my husband and my children he replied but where then is your husband i said laughing permit me citizen representative not to tell you as you wish he said gaily the monster was very amiable his beautiful mistress had threatened to see him no longer if he did not save me and this menace had enchained his cruelty for the moment after several minutes of conversation they spoke of going to the house of the swedish consul I excused myself from going under the pretext that I must look after my children, whom the maid had brought to Canole. But Madame de Fontenay, looking at me with her big black eyes, said, Venez donc. And I understood with horror what was about to happen. She herself took the arm of Monsieur de Bourquin, and Talien offered me his. I do not know how to express what I felt at this moment. If only my own life had been in question, and if that of my husband had not depended upon my taking the arm which he offered me, I should have refused. I therefore accepted, and took advantage of the moment to arrange my affair definitely. The poor Swedish consul and his charming daughter were more dead than alive at receiving this amiable visit from the representative of the people. We entered the billiard room where Talian played two or three games, including one with poor Bourquin, who missed nearly all his strokes, and though he was a very good player. Finally, Talian declared that he had an engagement and that he was obliged to leave. He took out his watch and looked at the time. You have there a pretty watch, said Madame de Fontenay. Yes, he replied. It is one of the new watches of Breguet, and is worth from seven to eight thousand francs. Would you like to have it? he added, in offering it to her. Ah, merci, she said, as if he had offered her a flower. And taking the watch, she put it in her bag. This incident caused me a profound disgust, for it was the act of a corrupted courtesan. This visit finished, we returned Bourquin and I to Canole, where Monsieur de Chambeau had concealed himself upon the arrival of Tallien. When we were alone, 
the alteration in the face of Brouquin struck me. He threw himself upon a sofa in a great state of agitation, and in reply to my question as to the cause of his trouble, he said, Alas, you saw the watch which was given by Talien to Madame de Fontenay? Well, it belonged to poor Sege, the name of the former mayor of Bordeaux, an intimate friend of Brouquin, and one of the first victims of the terror at Bordeaux. When he was condemned, he placed this watch upon the desk of the tribunal, saying, Take it. I do not wish to have the executioner profit by it. And Talien took it and put it in his pocket. It is easy to comprehend the repulsion which this recital inspired in me. I would like to believe that the citizeness Theresia was ignorant of this fact when she accepted the present. Two hours after my return to Bordeaux, Alexandre, the secretary of Tanien, brought me the order enjoining upon the municipality of Bordeaux to deliver a passport to the citizen La Tour and his wife with two young children to go to Martinique on board the ship Diane. Once furnished with this precious paper, it only remained for me to recall my husband to Bordeaux, for the American captain would not have been willing to take him on board if these papers had not been in order. This journey from Tesson to Bordeaux was full of difficulties and dangers. As I have already said above, Bonny did not hesitate a moment, and set out for Blay with the falling tide. He had already procured a regular passport for himself, for without that he could not leave the department and enter that of the Charente Inferieure, in which was located Tesson, ten leagues from the frontier of the Gironde. But as soon as he returned to the Gironde, a simple carte de sûreté would be sufficient for him to travel anywhere in the department. Bonny had indeed his personal carte de sûreté, but it was necessary to procure one for my husband. He therefore went to find one of his friends, who for the moment was sick, and under the pretext that he had mislaid his own card, he borrowed the card of his friend for several days. Bonny set out that evening. I had calculated the moments that would be necessary to accomplish this perilous journey, and the third day, towards nine o'clock in the evening, I thought that the boat which came every day from Blay with the tide would bring to me the travellers so anxiously awaited. The fever of impatience which devoured me would not permit me to remain in the house. With Monsieur de Chambeau, I went upon the Chartron to the place where I knew the Blay boat should arrive. The darkness was so profound that it was impossible to see the water in the river. I did not dare to ask for any information as I knew that all the points on the river were observed by numerous police spies. Finally, after a long wait, we heard the clock strike the hour of 9.30, and M. de Chambeau, who had no carte de sûreté, remarked to me that we had only half an hour to return to the house without danger. Having lost all hope for that day, I returned to the house, where I passed the night and imagining with anguish all the obstacles which might have delayed Bonnie and his unfortunate companion. While I was trembling thus with anxiety and impatience, my husband was sleeping quietly upon a comfortable bed, prepared for him by Bonnie before his departure, in one of the unoccupied rooms of the house. In the morning, the maid, when she came to dress my little girl, said to me, with an indifferent air, A propos, madame, Monsieur Bonnet est là, qui demande si vous êtes levé. I made a prodigious effort not to cry out, and the reader can understand that my toilette was not long. Bonnie then entered, and informed me that they had arrived too late at Blay to take the ordinary boat, upon which my husband also might have been recognised. He had chartered a fishing bark, and the wind being favourable and very strong, he had set out with his companion and soon overtaken and then passed the ordinary boat. They had therefore already arrived, when I was waiting for them in a state of despair upon the bank of the river. 
I was dying with impatience to enter the room where my husband was concealed, but Bonny advised me to dress as if I were going out, so as to deceive the maid. Finally, a half hour later, I went out under the pretext of doing some shopping, and Bonny having rejoined me, he conducted me by a secret staircase to my husband's room. It was thus that we met after six months of the most painful separation. End of part one, chapter fifteen. Part one, chapter sixteen of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1794 Voyage to Boston. I have already related how I took out two months before a certificate of residence with nine witnesses under the name of Dillon Gouvernet. It was now necessary to go and obtain a passport under the name of La Tour, and to avoid the name of Dillon, which was too well known at Bordeaux. I decided to replace the name of Dillon with that of Lee, which my uncle Lord Dillon had added to his own when he received the inheritance of Lord Lichfield, his great-uncle. It was impossible to draw back. The Bureau of Passports was closed at nine o'clock, and we went there at eight-thirty. The date was the 8th of March, 1794. My husband walked quite a distance ahead with Bonny. I followed, accompanied by a friend of the latter, who carried in his arms my little girl, six months of age, and led by the hand my son, who was not then four years old. On account of the English or American name which I wished to take, I was dressed as a lady, but very badly gotten up and wearing an old straw hat. We entered the hall of the Hôtel de Ville, which was full of people. I was trembling with fear lest some inhabitant of Saint-André de Cubzac or of Bordeaux should recognise us. We therefore took care, Monsieur de la Tour du Pain and I, to keep as far apart from one another as possible, and to avoid the lighted part of the hall. Furnished with this card, we ascended to the Bureau of Passports, and as we entered, we heard the employé cry out, That is enough for today, the rest tomorrow. Any delay would have cost our lives, as you will see. Bunny rushed up to the desk and said, If you are tired, citizen, I will write for you. The other consented, and Bonnie made out the collective passport for the Latour family. As soon as the passport was signed, we took it with keen satisfaction, although we were still very far from being saved. It had been arranged in order that we should not both be found in the same house, and to avoid the necessity of passing through Bordeaux the following morning in full daylight, that Monsieur de la Tour du Pain should pass the night with the Consul of Holland, Monsieur Meyer, who lived in the last house of the Chartrand, and was entirely devoted to us. Monsieur de Bouchon was waiting for us in the street, and conducted my husband there. As for myself, after having taken the children back to the house, I went to see Madame de Fontenay, where I expected to see Talien, who had to visa our passport. I found her in tears. Talian had received the order of his recall, and had already left two hours before. She herself was to leave in the morning, and she did not conceal from me her fears that the ferocious Isabeau, the colleague of Talian, would refuse to visa our passport. But Alexandre, the secretary of Talian, assured us that he would obtain the visa. He said that Isabeau always signed on leaving the theatre, and that, as he was in haste to have his supper, he hardly regarded the papers which were presented to him. Providence, in its kindness, had wished that Isabeau should demand of Talian to leave with him his secretary, Alexandre, who not only was very useful to him, but also had the address to render himself necessary. At the moment that I entered the house of Madame de Fontenay, Alexandre left to go and get the signature. He
he took the passport and slipped it in between a number of others isabeau who was very much taken up that day with the arrival of his new colleague whom he looked for in the morning signed without paying any attention and as soon as alexandre was at liberty to leave he ran to madame de fontenay's where i was waiting more dead than alive i was not there alone for a person whom i did not know had entered this man was no other than monsieur de fontenay at this moment alexandre arrived holding the passport unfolded in his hand he was so out of breath that he fell on a chair without being able to articulate more than the words le voila madame de fontenay and i embraced him with all our hearts for he was our real sauveur alexandre was getting ready to leave and as it was nearly midnight i also prepared to leave with him madame de fontenay kept me for a moment by saying that she would have me escorted but that before i left she wished to show me something very pretty i followed her into her bedroom where monsieur de fontenay who was still silent accompanied us from a drawer she took out a handkerchief and laid it upon the table then opening a handsome jewel case she took out a collection of diamonds of the greatest magnificence and threw them upon the handkerchief pell-mell when she had thus emptied all the drawers of the jewel box without leaving the least thing she tied up the ends of the handkerchief and handed it to monsieur de fontenay with these words prenez tout and he indeed took all and went out without opening his mouth i showed my great surprise and she replied to my thought by saying he had given me a part the rest came from my mother he also is leaving to-morrow for america all of our baggage had now been on board for three days without my spy having imagined that all the wardrobes and all the drawers were empty i paid the most tender adieu to my maid marguerite whom i left under the protection of monsieur de Boucan. finally on the tenth of march taking my daughter seraphine in my arms and my son humbert by the hand i said to the nurse that i was going to take them to the allee de tourney which at this time is still the usual promenade for children and that i would be back in an hour or two instead of returning i walked towards the glacis de chateau trompette where i rejoined monsieur de chambeau to whom i had given rendezvous he had also obtained passage on our boat as it was necessary for political reasons for him to leave the city with the shortest possible delay i found him at the chateau de trompette accompanied by a boy carrying his portmanteau which was very light he took the hand of Humbert, and when we arrived at the end of the chartron and saw the boat of the diane we both of us experienced a feeling of joy such as one does not often have in this life monsieur meyer with whom my husband had passed the night was awaiting us we found already at luncheon the good Brucon, madame de fontenay and three or four other persons in spite of all our efforts the famine at bordeaux was so great that we had been able to procure very few provisions several sacks of potatoes and of beans a small box of preserves and fifty bottles of bordeaux wine comprised all our riches captain pierce had several casks of biscuits but they were eighteen months old as he had brought them from baltimore monsieur meyer gave me a little bag of fresh biscuits which i kept to make soup for my little girl but of what importance was all that compared to the fact that the life of my husband was saved madame de fontenay was overjoyed at her success her beautiful face was bathed with tears of joy when we entered the boat she has since told me that this moment thanks to our expressions of gratitude was one of the pleasantest of which she had preserved the memory when the captain was seated at the helm and cried off a feeling of indescribable happiness overcame me seated before my husband whose life i was saving with my two children upon my knees nothing to me seemed impossible poverty work misery nothing was difficult with him 
the boat Diane had descended with the preceding tide as far as Bec d'Ambez, where we were to rejoin it. We had received orders from headquarters to hail a ship of war stationed as sentinel in the middle of the river at the entrance of the port. Our captain prepared to submit his papers and our passports. This was a dangerous moment. We did not dare to speak French, nor to look up towards the bridge of the war vessel. The captain alone went on board. He did not know a word of French, although he had spent a year at Bordeaux. A voice from the bridge cried, Have the woman come up to serve as interpreter. I was struck with a mortal terror. But our captain leaned over the rail and told me not to answer. I did not raise my eyes. At this moment a French boat in great haste and full of men in uniform approached. The captain took advantage of this diversion, seized his papers, jumped into the boat, and we rowed away as fast as possible. At last we found our little vessel, the Diane, and settled ourselves on board as well as possible. The second falling tide took us in front of Poyac, where we had again to receive the visit of two other guard vessels. The officers who came on board were very polite, but very inquisitive. As the wind was absolutely contrary and showed no signs of changing, the captain proposed to us to go on land for dinner, where we might have a chance to buy some articles to add to our provisions. Here we had a narrow escape from being recognised by a servant who served the dessert and who thought she recognised my husband. It was therefore with a feeling of relief that we found ourselves once more in the cabin of the Diane. Fortunately the wind changed, and the following day we left behind us the Tour de Cordouan. The little brig upon which we had embarked was only of a hundred and fifty tons, that is to say a large bark as the cargo was composed solely of our twenty-five boxes or trunks the boat rolled horribly my maritime apprenticeship was very painful we had agreed with our captain regarding our board but he as unfortunate as ourselves had not been able to procure provisions other than those which had been furnished by the marine stores at the time of our departure from bordeaux one of the four sailors that had a terrible fall from the top of the mast into the hold and was out of service only three sailors remained to manoeuvre the boat the crew therefore consisted only of these three sailors a cabin boy who acted as servant the captain who was a young man without much experience the mate who like himself was from nantucket and an old sailor of much experience named harper whom the captain consulted on every occasion. The captain had a little room which he occupied alone. He had given a cabin to my husband and myself, and another to Monsieur de Chambeau. My husband did not leave his bed for thirty days. He suffered terribly from seasickness, and also from the poor food. At the time, the Americans were at war with the Algerians, who had already captured several of their vessels. Our captain was in such great terror of these pirates that at two leagues from the Tour de Cordouan he set his course towards the north and declared that nothing in the world would reassure him before he was to the north of Ireland. One day the sailor who was on watch upon the deck cried out, French man of war ahead! The captain rushed on deck, and at the same time ordered us not to appear. A cannon shot was heard. It was the commencement of a conversation upon which depended the question of our life or death. The vessel announced itself as French by displaying its flag. We also showed our flag, and after the usual questions we heard our captain reply, for we were not able to distinguish the questions from the French boat, No passengers! no cargo to which the atalante replied come on board our captain said that the sea was too rough then the conversation terminated with a word from the french vessel follow and we set our only sail 
and with submission followed in the wake of the French vessel. The captain, on descending, said to us gaily, In another hour it will be night, and there is a fog coming on. Never was a fog hailed with greater joy. We soon lost sight of the frigate in the darkness, and as we were making as little sail as possible, she continued to gain upon us. The frigate had signalled to us that she was going into Brest and wanted us to follow. As soon as night fell, we took the route directly contrary, and the wind being very strong and favourable, with all sail set, we laid our course to the northwest, without caring whether or not it was the route to Boston, where we were to go. This incident threw us completely out of our course and we experienced thick fogs which did not enable us to take an observation for a period of twelve or fifteen days. Provisions commenced to run short, and we were put upon a ration of water. We encountered an English vessel coming from Ireland, and our captain went on board and returned with a bag of potatoes and two small pots of butter for myself and children. Having compared his position with that of the English captain, he found that we were fifty leagues to the north of the Azores. On learning this, my husband prayed him to put us on the shore of the Azores, from which we might have been able to gain England. But the captain was unwilling to do so. Ten days followed, in which we were unable to take an observation, and the fog was so dense that even upon our little boat we could not see the bowsprit. The captain did not know where he was. Old Harper assured us that he felt land breezes, but we thought that he was endeavouring to cheer us up. Finally, the 12th of May, 1794, at daybreak, as the weather was warm and the sea calm, we were on deck with the children to breathe the fresh air. The fog was still very dense, and the captain declared that the land was still at a distance of at least fifty or sixty leagues. I could not help remarking, however, the nervousness of the dog, a black terrier, of which I was very fond, and who had taken a great fancy to me. The poor beast rushed forward barking, and then at once returned to me and licked my hands, and then repeated the same action. This singular performance had already lasted for an hour, when a little pilot boat appeared near to us, and a man cried in English, If you do not change your direction, you are going to run on to the Cape. A cord was thrown to him, and he sprang on board. It is impossible to describe the joy we felt upon seeing this pilot from Boston. We had arrived, without knowing it, at the entrance of this magnificent harbour, of which the finest lake in Europe can give no idea. Leaving the open sea, where the waves were breaking with fury over the rocks, we entered by a narrow passage where two vessels could hardly pass at the same time into a body of water as quiet and smooth as a mirror. A light breeze came up from the friendly land which was to receive us. The transports of my son cannot be described. For a period of sixty days he had heard us talk of the dangers from which, thanks to heaven, we had escaped. The remembrance of good white bread and of the good milk of other days often troubled his young imagination. When he saw from this straight passage by which we were entering the green fields, the trees and flowers, and all the beauty of the most luxuriant vegetation, his joy was unbounded. Our own, although more reasonable, was not less intense. End of part one, chapter sixteen.